Okay, so uh, in the framework of our seminar series, you know that uh, from time to time uh, we have a seminar of psychiatry, and this is the case today because we are welcoming, uh, it's a pleasure for us, Marion Le Boyer, who is just uh, coming back from New York. So uh, thank you for giving uh, so this seminar <coughs> just as after your trip. And uh, so the Marion Le Boyer is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Créteil. Uh, she passed, uh, I think, a, a PhD in neuroscience. And she is doing many things. Uh, she is, uh, in particular, uh, the head of a, a translational laboratory in psychiatry at Créteil. And uh, she is also the director of president, I don't know what is the title, of the, of the Fundamental, Foundation, Fundamental Foundation. And the talk today will be devoted to immunopsychiatry. Uh, so I may be completely wrong, but I think this idea of immunopsychiatry uh, rose with uh, in relationship uh, with uh, in relation with uh, depression, I think perhaps at the beginning, in, and uh, there is a lot uh, of interest in uh, this topic uh, in the past years. And I remember, I, recommend, uh, I would, would like to recall that uh, two years ago we organized the INC Day on the topic. Uh, of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders and their uh, psychiatric uh, consequences. And so uh, now we'll, uh, we'll have today, I guess, the answer to that question, is it time or not for immunopsychiatry? So thank you, Marion. Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, I did my first year of medical studies here. I will not tell you how long that was. because It's too long for me to, com to calculate. Uh, and I'm very happy to, be, to have been invited to talk on, on one of my favorite uh, topics, which is immunopsychiatry. So I will try to convince you that it's time for immunopsychiatry. It's a very old topic, in fact, because it's been described years ago. And uh, now it's really a, a topic of a great, great area with a lot of research being performed, uh, both in basic science but also uh, in translational approach. So there are two major reasons why we are very interested in this uh, on this topic. The first is that it opens up a uh, new hypothesis regarding mechanisms of major psychiatric disorders. The second reason is that uh, we hope we're going to be able to identify uh, biomarkers, biomarker signature for this disorder. We know that, you know probably that we don't have today any uh, marker to precisely diagnose and eventually identify subgroups, so it's a big hope. And of course the third hope is that we're going to discover new treatments focused on different pathways. So to try to describe this, I'm going first to um, describe the clinical arguments that help us to establish links between uh, description of these major psychiatric disorders and immunology, the immune dysfunction. And I'm just going to give you an overview and give different examples uh, on different disorders. The second is uh, to describe the biological arguments and all the in inflammatory markers uh, infections and immunogenetic background, and then I will describe the consequences of this inflammation at three levels, uh, peripheral and brain barriers, the presence of autoantibodies, and the activation of human endogenous retrovirus, and I will end by uh, describing some of the studies, clinical trials on different anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory treatment. So let's turn and let's do a bit of uh, clinical work. Uh, so uh, you have uh, for most of you heard about the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of uh, uh, describing the different uh, psychiatric disorders. The big problem is, is that none of these disorders uh, have valid biomarkers and uh, it's the same for inflammation. We find uh, elevated inflammatory markers in all these disorders. Uh, you can see, uh, for example, autism, anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, anorexia, suicide, bipolar disorder, depression, and in particular resistant depression, schizophrenia, and cognitive decline. All of these disorders have different type of, uh, have different association with all these uh, biomarkers, and uh, we are not able today to be able to describe any links with any particular biomarkers and any disorders. The second uh, problem, which is a, a major problem in psychiatry, is that we don't know if this inflammatory uh, pathway or core markers is associated with a, a, a common dimension which would be common to different psychiatric disorders. 
Uh, you have maybe heard about the RDOC, which have been described by the NIMH a few years ago, and uh, ask us now not to work only on the definition of the DSM, but to try to identify different dimensions which would also be tested, which is probably of interest to you in animal models. Uh, so we don't know if this inflammatory component is associated, <coughs> should be viewed as a, a common denominator associated with dimensions, such as anhedonia, for example, or if it is linked to specific subgroups of psychiatric disorders. So today we, we have description of very large disorders, uh, such as bipolar disorders, which have an S, because most probably it's a group of disorders and we need biomarkers to identify them. So it's a big question today uh, about, uh, about is it an overlapping marker or is it specific to a subgroup that we need to identify. The third main question, which is today uh, something which is very well known, is that the division between psychiatric and the rest of medicine is an absurd, it's totally absurd. We know now that our patients develop either before the development or the occurrence of the psychiatric disorders or during the course of the disorders, they are at risk of developing uh, several somatic comorbid disorders, which today in France are very badly di diagnosed because of the separation between psychiatric disorders and the rest of medicine. So here is an example for bipolar disorder. You all know what is bipolar disorder, I suspect. So bipolar disorder, we know now that it is associated with several medical disorders such as migraine, autoimmune disorders, diabetes, cardiovascular disorder, and obesity. <laughs> and the, <coughs> the, the hypothesis is that inflammation might be uh, underlying these disorders and these comorbidities. And this is not a, a minor problem. It's probably what the, this comorbid medical disorder explained the increase of mortality uh, among our patients. We know that they die 20 years earlier than the same age in general population. And this is uh, one of the studies we have performed in the expert centers that we have created in the Fondation Fondamentale, where we systematically assess patients, not only for their psychiatric disorders, but also for their somatic disorders. And for example, here in the first 500 patients that we have seen, we have found two things. First, the bipolar patients on the left, they have 20% of uh, what we call metabolic syndrome, which, is, which are defined by obesity, hypertension, lipid abnormalities, or abnormalities in glycemia. And this is so twice the, the frequency of what is observed <clears throat> in the general population. And what is very worrying is that between 70 and 90% are neither diagnosed nor treated. So it's not only a, a, a question for research, because where and why, how can we explain this comorbid phenomenon, but also it's a matter of public health concern. And this is just to show you the importance of the, of the subject. Uh, the first cause in bipolar disorder of death is cardiovascular disorder and not suicide, which is something with you know, general belief about uh, psychiatric disorders and, and bipolar disorder in, in, in particular. So it's really a major problem to understand the cause of these uh, comorbid disorders. So uh, cardiovascular and metabolic syndrome are one thing, but another thing which is very relevant to uh, immune dysfunction is the observation that uh, autoimmune disorders and several se severe infections start before the onset of affective disorders. And this has been described in the, in the very well uh, in the cohort which have uh, been described in Northern Europe where they follow very precisely patients uh, since birth. And they have been, to, they've been able to, to show in Denmark that prior hospitalization for a two-immune disease increased the risk of later mood disorder, whatever the mood disorder, by 45%. Same thing with a, just a simple history, hospitalization uh, of infection which increased the risk of later uh, occurrence of major mood disorder by 62%. And you see on the slide there uh, that uh, there is a dose-response re relationship for the increase of occurrence of mood disorders when there are both uh, a prior hospitalization for a two-immune disorder and infection. <coughs> so basically you see that uh, it's clear that there is a general background uh, defined by several new elements which are now uh, very clearly described in the field of major psychiatric disorders, 
which are this heterogeneity, the overlapping between different disorders, uh, the association with several comorbid disorders before and after the onset of psychiatric disorder, which points to uh, the existence of uh, inflammation. So in terms of biological arguments, what do we know? So first, uh, something which is also clear is that after years of description of, immuno of, of genetic background in psychiatric disorders, we, we now are only starting to describe the environmental factors. So we are able now to describe some uh, rare or minor genetic factors associated with psychiatric disorders, and clearly it's not enough to have a genetic variance. Uh, these genetic variants put uh, these patients at risk of responding in, in a not efficient way to several environmental factors throughout the life of their patients. And several of these environmental factors have an impact on inflammation. So, <coughs> for example, in prenatal period, uh, I'm going to describe the importance of infection and the link of early infection to the occurrence of psychiatric disorders. Same with severe stress occur occurring during pregnancy. Same with diet problem and uh, something which was known for years, which is the excess of winter or spring birth. During childhood, uh, there, there is an, a huge literature showing the association with several psychiatric disorders of uh, early and severe childhood stress. And in young adults, we find again the uh, psychosocial stress, but also sleep loss, unhealthy diet, and low vitamin D. And each of these factors have very is very likely to have an impact on inflammation. So this is the same for uh, several disorders, and here is a description of what we know in the field of autism. <laughs> so in what we call the autism spectrum disorders, just to show that it's a very heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, spectrum of disorders, several studies have repeatedly demonstrated the impact of uh, infections occurring during pregnancy, showing that of course, there are genetic factors, which are now well known, but also uh, several environmental fa risk factors, such as infections. So the story of this description started in, in 64, uh, after a, a rubella pandemic, which was described by Chess, and showed an increased incidence of uh, autism spectrum disorders, which went from 0.05 to 8 to 13%. Later, again, in this very well-described Danish birth registry, there was an increase of uh, uh, autism in mothers who have been hospitalized for a viral infection or just for fever during the first term. And then uh, several publications of uh, case studies of maternal infections with several infections, such as influenza again, toxoplasmosis, CMV, HIV, uh, which have been reported to be uh, increasing the risk of having a child with autism. Same story of links between maternal infections and the increased risk for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. There is here a list, a uh, table describing uh, the increased risk, for example, of uh, influenza and a threefold increased risk or fourfold increased risk in bipolar disorder. Same with toxoplasmosis, which was a very well-known factor uh, in schizophrenia, but now it's known also in bipolar disorder. And same with HSV2. So there are a range of infections uh, occurring during pregnancy, which increase the risk of uh, occurrence of la later in life of uh, major psychiatric disorder, all of them starting uh, between 15 and 25 years of age. If we compare uh, the, the odd ratio, the risk associated with the gene factor, which have been described repeatedly in psychiatric disorders, you see that the importance of the risk factor uh, associated with infections during pregnancy is much higher. So it's not something which is uh, uh, not to be considered. And for example, influenza during the first half of pregnancy is associated with uh, an odd ratio of three. Uh, toxoplasmosis with an odd ratio of 2.6. Infections, either genital or respiratory, is between 2 and 5. So it's much higher than any of the genetic variants which, which have been described as associated with an increased risk of schizophrenia. If we just take the example of toxoplasmosis, just to show you the, the, the implication of this, uh, so probably you know that toxoplasmosis is a very frequent uh, intracellular parasite. It's common because, this, as shown by the seroprevalence, which is above 
Uh, toxo is found uh, in contaminated water, in uncooked meat, uh, and it can also be ingested through uh, uh, soil which are infected by the oocyst, and also it's linked with cats because it's found also in cat litter box. There are lots of studies establishing links now, not only between infections during pregnancy, but also when the psychiatric disorder has uh, started. Uh, several, disorder, several studies, I'm just going to describe one we have conducted in my, we have performed in my department, where we have shown that uh, in a random sample of schizophrenia, of bipolar patients, uh, we found that nearly 80% of the patients had elevated levels of IgG compared to 60% in controls, is something very frequent in France. And we also have performed a meta-analysis of all the uh, studies performed until 2014 and showed very high uh, odd ratio for several disorders, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, addiction, and uh, also obsessive compulsive disorder, which was not expected when we started the study. So basically, as I showed you in the, in the diagram where I showed that it was really phenomena which, was, which were found in several psychiatric disorders, it's clearly shown here for the example of toxoplasmosis. So knowing that, the question we tried to answer was why? Why our patients have uh, infectious stigma in the blood that stays lo longer and persistent? <coughs> and the hypothesis was to try to find links between immunogenetic background. Uh, basically, the question we ask is, could there be a, a genetic background which would explain that the patients do not fight the way they should uh, against uh, very frequent infections, which would explain that they keep in the blood some stigma of infections. So this is, of course, the hypothesis uh, which is uh, at the uh, interface between environment and gene, and basically which try to find if genetic risk factors put us at, at risk of not being able to cope with environmental risk factors. And uh, we have studied two types of environmental factors, infections, and stress. To do that, we have selected several genes which uh, belong to different types of uh, the immunogenetic background. So immunogenetic diversity is very important for, as it, it influences the type and the severity of an infectious event. It will modulate the response, the inflammatory response uh, when having an infection, and it contributes to the occurrence of a particular disorder uh, and comorbidities. comorbidities. So we studied uh, adaptive immunity, which is HLA, but also innate immunity, which is the immunity which starts just after an infection and which is something innate. And for this, we studied the genes encoding toll-like receptors. And we also studied uh, genes encoding cytokines, chemokines, and different receptors. So of course, we're not the only one in the world to do that. And just want to give you one example of a very large uh, studies, uh, which you see gather all basically the genetic studies in the world. So France was also part of this study, which was performed on nearly 40,000 patients. And uh, this is a GWAS. I suppose you're all very familiar with GWAS. And the results are significant when the results are above this red line. And you see that there is clearly a peak, which is in the HLA region, which is one of the highest ever published results in the field of the genetic of schizophrenia, and this was repl replicated. So basically, it's clear that uh, for HLA and uh, adaptive immunity, something happens in terms of genetics and in terms of the way our patients are being equipped uh, to face various types of uh, immune response. So we started in France by studying HLA-G, which belongs to the non-classical HLA class B, one beta family. And it's interesting because it's, uh, HLA-G has immunosuppressive and tolerogenic properties, which means that when uh, you have this uh, uh, gene expressed, it means that we or you will have uh, less uh, capacity to fight against an infection, for example. And what we found in a sample of uh, 500 uh, bipolar patients compared to control is that this uh, insertion, this HLAG insertion, is less prevalent among the bipolar patients, which probably, which lead to an increased expression of the HLAG molecule, and the increased expression of this molecule could be uh, associated with a decreased response to infectious pathogens. <coughs> 
We then moved on to study different genes implicated into innate immunity, and we worked on TOLAC receptor. So TOLAC receptors are uh, receptors which are implicated in the recognition of pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Each of them is able to recognize different, um, different pa uh, pathogens, in particular for TOLAC receptor 4, it recognizes viral proteins, the protein associated with Toxoplasma gondii that I was just mentioning, and one protein associated with an endogenous retrovirus that I will describe uh, later. Uh, TOLAC receptor 4 are expressed in several types of cells in the immune system, in the central nervous system, in the intestine, and in thyroid cells. And its role, role when it has, once it has recognized um, uh, the, the pathogen, is to uh, activate the immediate, immediate tissue uh, and, and lead to the increased product, pro production of cytokines and chemokines, which are pro-inflammatory. And so here again, we took a sample of bipolar patients uh, compared to controls, and we studied uh, functional polymorphisms, which is interesting in these ge candidate genes. They, can they are good candidates because of their role, but also because uh, it has been identified, po functional polymorphisms have been identified. And here we found uh, polymorphisms uh, put more frequent in early onset bipolar patients, which is a subgroup where we suspected that uh, inflammation would be more important. And we found that uh, this um, genotype was associated to decreased expression of TLR4 molecule in vitro, which could be uh, one reason why these uh, patients have a decreased response to infectious pathogens. So another reason genetically to be less efficient when having an infection. And another example which goes in the same way is that we also studied gene encoding TOLAC receptor 2, which is exactly the same type of receptor, but it recognized different uh, infectious pathogen, which are described here, and it has exactly the same type of action, inducing inflammation. Um, and we found the same type of results. Uh, we studied a functional polymorphism and found that uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, genotype is associated is more frequent to in early onset bipolar patients, and this polymorphism is known to diminish the expression of IL-10, IL-10 being a, 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 an anti-inflammatory uh, cytokine. So it could be another reason why these patients have a genetic equipment which lead to a decreased response against infectious pathogens. So this is the beginning of a story which leads to the description of a genetic background which would explain why these patients keep in the blood some infectious stigma towards different um, uh, pathogens which lead to a low-grade inflammation. And uh, we, we're starting to see in the literature some studies studying gene-environment interaction, not with uh, immunogenetic variants, but, for example, here this is a study published by uh, Faith Dickerson in Baltimore at the Stanley Foundation. And they have shown that when a patient carries a polymorphism of the COMT, catecholome methyltransferase uh, gene, and uh, a stigma of the her herpes infection uh, in bipolar patients, it leads to an, an increased risk for cognitive decline. So it's just the beginning of description of immunogenetic background and the beginning of description of uh, gene-environment interaction, but just, this is a very, uh, very uh, prominent field. So other example uh, of uh, environmental factors is, of course, stress. We all know that stress is associated with several psychiatric disorder. And uh, now it's also very clearly demonstrated that severe and early uh, stress in, in induce and is associated with psychiatric disorders, but also cardiovascular disorders, neurodegenerative disorders, uh, cardiovascular obesity, asthma, and diabetes, all sorts of disorders which occur together. Uh, so it's also uh, known that uh, the same type of inflammatory markers which are found in psychiatric disorders or in cardiovascular disorders are associated with bad treatment during childhood, so severe stress uh, during childhood, which is associated with an elevation of CRP, IL-6, and 10-F-alpha. And there is also a huge literature, this is a paper published in my department by Bruno Etain, where uh, he has demonstrated that childhood abuse uh, was associated with an earlier age at onset. So the more uh, this patient experience early and severe stress, the earlier the disorder will, will start.
So we have tried to find if, if there was an interaction between the fact of carrying this vulnerable genotype of toll-like receptor and having been exposed to uh, severe and early stress. And we found that being carrier of a vulnerable genotype and being exposed to stress uh, diminish the, uh, uh, the aged onset of the disorder. So now let's turn to inflammation. So we have a genetic background interacting with environmental factors which lead to the persistence of uh, stigma and what are these stigma in terms of inflammation? How can we describe the low-grade inflammation which is found in different disorders? So this is a summary of thousands of studies uh, just to describe that we can find both markers of peripheral inflammation and brain inflammation. So in the periphery we found uh, elevated cytokines level, IL-6, TNF-alpha, uh, IL-10, IL-4, uh, IL-2 receptor, uh, and this has been widely replicated in several meta-analyses. Uh, it's also been found that uh, in confirmed in meta-analyses that there is an increase of C-reactive protein, low level, it's low-grade inflammation, and also activation of T-cell system and macrophage monocyte. In the brain, in the CSF in particular, the same elevation of cytokines has been found, uh, elevation or activation of mRNA, in post-mortem cortex and activation of microglia. And there are also uh, several studies being performed now with brain imaging showing inflammation in the brain. Another important fact is uh, found in schizophrenia. So you probably know that now we're able to describe schizophrenia as being a disorder which uh, go through different stages. It's, it's the staging of a psychiatric disorder, similarly to what is described in cardiovascular disorder or uh, in cancer, for example. It's not fixed disorder. It's something that evolves. And of course, several studies have been performed trying to identify a signature, an inflammatory signature of each of these stages. So this is a, a very general description uh, which was recently published in, a, a review, in good review, showing that at each phase there are different inflammatory markers which are being uh, described. So in the premorbid phase, before the onset of schizophrenia, there is uh, uh, abnormalities of cytokines in peripheral blood and uh, also elevation of, uh, in the CSF. And then in the first episode, you see that there are more markers being abnormal, in particular regarding um, cell abnormalities, uh, alteration on lymphocyte and monocyte cells, and abnormalities of oxidative stress as well. And then acute illness and chronic illness, you have more and more uh, inflammatory markers. So it's the very beginning of being able to uh, have a valid signature of these different stages, which so far have been only clinically described. Other examples, just to show you that really this is being found everywhere in psychiatry, is uh, autism spectrum disorders, which is probably one of the mo most inflammatory disorders. So you know that autism has been successively described as being a disorder which, which was caused by the mo mothers. Then we in France were the first to describe the genes implicated in abnormality in the development of uh, the central nervous system. With Thomas Bourgeon, we described uh, a cascade of abnormalities of gene variants, the neuroligin, Shank3, etc. And now we're starting to describe uh, and see, being described in literature, a whole uh, array of uh, abnormalities in inflammation. So in the periphery, uh, it's been widely demonstrated that they, they have uh, hyperactivation of monocytes and NK cells. Uh, their PBMC, with PBMC, it's, it's been shown that there is an increased response uh, by uh, after stimulation with LPS and with pro-inflammatory cytokines. We also find in the periphery elevation of cytokines, diminished Treg, and in the brain, again in the brain and the CSF, elevation of these uh, pro-inflammatory markers, activation of microglia, and upregulation of immunogenetic uh, genes uh, in post-mortem brain. So altogether, how can we give a, a description which could be tested of all these data? What is the mechanisms and what could be the pathway and the history to explain uh, all these abnormalities? So the way which is now uh, a way to describe things uh, is to start by the description of gene and environment, uh, describe the description of the, the immunogenetic background on the way, and same for um, 
successive factors occurring during life, which will, in, in interaction with the genetic background, lead to the occurrence of low-grade inflammation, very early infections, stress, lifestyle, and all sorts of factors which remain to be demonstrated. For example, there is lots of studies ongoing in the States today to uh, study the impact of pollutants, and they might take the same route or abnormal diets. We don't know yet, but we, this is a way really to, to be explored. And the, this inflammation has different type of consequences in the periphery, which I just described, in the brain, and also in the, in the gut. And you have probably heard, uh, because it's very uh, fashionable at the moment, the consequences on the uh, microbiota with the dysbiosis. So it's interesting in terms of mechanisms, which can be tested, for example, in animal models. It's also interesting because you see we, we're starting to be able to describe uh, peripheral biological signature, and it's also interesting <laughs> because it means that we can try to identify new treatments which are very different from the classical dopamine blockers or 5-HT, uh, Prozac, and all these sorts of treatments with anti-inflammatory treatments both targeting periphery or the brain, immunomodulation for two antibodies, and probiotics uh, with the hypothesis of dysbiosis. So what are the consequences of this inflammation? And I will try to describe, uh, to describe this uh, by uh, describing increased permeability of barriers, the presence of two antibodies, and the activation of uh, human endogenous retrovirus. So this inflammation, of course, uh, has consequences. Uh, and one of the consequences which has been uh, clearly described is the increased permeability of the digestive tract. So you see here uh, a description uh, of the gut. And we know that this per the permeability of the gut is increased by infection, inflammation, stress, toxins, and of course, dysbiosis. And this uh, has a, a consequence, this increased uh, permeability induced the fact that there is an increased antigen traffic uh, which goes to the bloodstream where normally it does not go. And depending on the genetic background, in particular HLA, it will induce the occurrence of autoantibodies and autoimmune disorders. So, it's important to be able to describe immunogenetic background, and in particular HLA, to see if we find uh, that these patients are carriers of HLA genotype, which would be associated to increased production of uh, autoimmune. And I will just describe one uh, example of autoantibodies, uh, which has been uh, the matter of a lot of discussion, which you probably have heard, which is the uh, encephalitis with autoantibodies against NMDA receptor. So I could have taken lots of other examples, but this is something which really uh, is a matter of a lot of discussion. But of course, in our patient, we found both autoantibodies against peripheral targets and different autoantibodies against the brain. But this one is interesting both for discussion and to understand what's happening. So Joseph Dalmo in the States uh, in the 70s has been able to identify uh, uh, what was called encephalitis against NMDA receptor, which is a clinical, uh, with a clinical description which is here, which is very clear and quite well known, which is the, the disorder starts by something which looked like the flu for one week, and then a, a sometimes very brief or longer period with neuropsychiatric symptoms, totally aspecific. It can be either hallucinations or mood symptoms. And it's followed or not followed by neurological complications, but when they occur, which means that it's a diagnosis of encephalitis can be made, uh, they are very severe and uh, associated uh, movement abnormalities, dysautonomia, hypoventilations, seizures, and uh, it can be either diagnosed by the presence of this autoantibody in the blood and treated, and when it's treated, most of the patients are totally uh, cured and can go back to a normal life. So what's interesting is to describe the mechanisms, which has been uh, clearly described. So the um, O2 antibody blocks uh, the extracellular subunit on the left here of the NMDA receptor, and then when the O2 antibody has uh, been linked to the receptor, there is um, 
internalization and then degradation of the NMDA receptor, leading, of course, to a dramatic reduction of the uh, NMDA receptor at the synaptic lift, which explains the severity of the symptoms. So that's what happened in the encephalitis. Soon after the description of this encephalitis, there were several reports uh, of the presence of autoantibodies against NMDA-R only in purely psychiatric patients with no, not this uh, severe neurological disorder associated. And in particular, this was very well described by a journalist called Susanna Kalan, which, who described very clearly the beginning of a manic, uh, very severe manic episode while she was crossing a road in New York and uh, she had an extremely severe and resistant disorder, disorder. and uh, thanks to her parents who we were sure that there was something organic between this disorder that the, uh, the autoantibody was identified, she was successfully treated and she wrote a very interesting book describing her experience. In the same time, several papers were published describing purely psychiatric patients having these autoantibodies and as usually in psychiatry, several discrepant results. Uh, discrepant results both in terms of the fluid where the autoantibodies were found. It was either in the serum, either in, uh, in the CSF. Discrepancies in the method uh, used and a uh, very different uh, percentage, even uh, control, normal controls showing the NMDA receptor. So a lot of chaos and discussions uh, uh, and we have published a, a paper with Emmanuel Le Guin reviewing these different discrepancies. So in collaboration with Laurent Groc in uh, Bordeaux, we tried to understand why and how we could explain these differences, in particular trying to understand the mechanisms of action of autoantibodies uh, in psychotic patients and comparing uh, autoantibodies between coming from schizophrenic patients or coming from encephalitis. So what we found first is that um, when comparing healthy controls and schizophrenic patients, first we have not found the autoantibodies in the CSF, but only in the blood. So that's one first difference between encephalitis patients and patients with purely psychiatric uh, clinical uh, symptoms. And the second difference is that in the patients with, uh, with schizophrenia, there is a different mechanism of action of the autoantibodies. It does not lead to the degradation, internalization and degradation of the NMDA receptor. It, increase, it changed totally the, the dynamic of the receptor at the surface of the synaptic cleft, and it increases tremendously the movements that the receptor has at the surface of the synapse. So it's a very different mechanism. We performed then another study where we tried to identify clinical symptoms uh, trying to, which would help us to uh, um, search for these autoantibodies. And so we did a retrospective study of patients for whom uh, presence of the NMDA receptor was documented, but who have initially been hospitalized in psychiatric department before being transferred to a neurologic department. And we found that 30% of them were initially hospitalized in psychiatry. None of them had a specific symptoms. They had uh, either symptoms uh, of uh, mood disorders or uh, hallucinations. Most of them were women. And uh, most of them had very subtle neurological symptoms such as migraines, confusion, amnesia, uh, very subtle abnormal movements. and. Uh, a at least 25% of them uh, have a very bad reaction to uh, antipsychotic, to neuroleptic with uh, neuroleptic intolerance. So I turn now to another consequence of um, this inflammation, and I will explain at the end what could be the link between those two. We've been working with, for, for the past 10 years with another hypothesis of the consequence of these infections leading to inflammation, which is the activation of human endogenous retrovirus. So probably you know very well what are these uh, endogenous retroviruses. They're composed 8% of the genome. Most of them are inactive. They're being transmitted from generation to generation, uh, being totally inactive. But in some, some cases, they can be reactivated. And in particular, they can be reactivated by uh, infections and the same infections that were described in schizophrenia. This is why I was interested in studying this retrovirus years ago. And they act as retroviruses, which mean that the 
they, they can replicate in the host cell by uh, the phenomenon of reverse transcription. So why being interested in, in major psychiatric disorder? Well, basically because we know that the uh, activation of the endogenous retrovirus can be induced by uh, the infections that I described before, which are uh, perinatal infections by influenza or toxoplasma and, or by secondary infection by HSV-1. And when the retrovirus is being activated, it produces a virion, and the envelope, the proteic envelope of the virion, has in itself uh, pro inflammatory and neurotoxic uh, actions, which could be one uh, lead to a psychotic uh, disorder. Uh, so this uh, was uh, also studied by different studies. It was first published uh, by uh, Deb Rinker uh, in, the, in 1999 in a pair of monozygotic twin discordant for schizophrenia. It was the very first study, study or showing difference in the DNA of HERFW. Then there were several studies showing both elevation of RNA or the protein associated with the activation of endogenous retrovirus in different liquids, again in the brain, in the CSF, and in the serum. And in France, we performed two studies in collaboration with Hervé Perron, who is the discoverer of this uh, human endogenous retrovirus. And for example, here in 50% of, uh, in 50 patients having um, uh, treated or not treated schizophrenia, randomly selected in, in my department, we found that uh, this envelope was uh, elevated in the serum of schizophrenic patients. And very clearly correlated between C-reactive proteins. So there is an increase and an activation and clearly an association with inflammation. And we did the same study not only on schizophrenia but also on bipolar patient, studying uh, RNA of the uh, HERFW uh, envelope and found differences in distribution with an increased uh, presence of uh, mRNA in the blood of bipolar patients even stronger than in schizophrenic patients. So what is the link between, the possible link between this activation and the presence of autoantibody that I just described? Well, we tried again with Laurent Grock to see what was happening when we added to uh, hypocampal mixed this uh, envelope protein. It, it has the same action on an MDA receptor. It increases also the dynamic of the NMDA receptor. So basically, the hypothesis is that we have two different mechanism, uh, I hope I can show you, uh, two different mechanism leading to uh, highly uh, perturbed glutamatergic transmission, either by uh, an antibody, an autoantibody, or uh, by reactivation of a human and retrovirus. And it's important both, again, in terms of mechanisms, in terms of biomarker, and in terms of treatment, because in the case of NMD autoantibodies, we can treat the patients, and in case of HFW, there are uh, treatments being developed uh, for, not for psychiatry, but which could maybe be used one day. So just in terms, trying to summarize, because we are close to the end, just want to uh, show that uh, there are lots of things which remain to be tested. This paper was just published uh, the week, a uh, week ago, uh, showing what remains to be tested and showing also that it uh, opens the door to precision medicine in psychiatry by uh, opening the door to biomarkers which would lead to specific treatment, which is something very uh, innovative in, in psychiatry. Uh, but still, we still have uh, lots of questions. Uh, we need to understand if it's uh, subgroups or if it's dimension. And I didn't have time to explain what the hypothesis we have in terms of subgroups. It's very likely that we need to identify subgroups with uh, association to uh, psychiatric uh, to psychiatric disorders. But so, for example, for autism, it's could be that a subgroup of patients with autism have the highest inflammatory markers, and in particular the patients having what we call regressive autism, which are patients who have a normal development until 18 to 24 months, and then suddenly uh, they lose all the cognitive capacities and they develop autism. And so it's probably in this subgroup that uh, they have the most uh, important inflammatory um, uh, biomarkers. Same for depression, it's probably not the uh, all the patients with depression that have an uh, inflammatory background, but probably what we call atypical depression, which are depressed patients having uh, severe anhedonia, uh, hypersomnia, being uh, very slow, and these remain to be tested, but 
uh, both in animal models and in clinical studies, this is a subgroup which is starting to be uh, described. So we also need to identify, and animal models could help us as well to identify if it's dimensions and subgroup. And uh, we also have to be conscious that, conscious that there are lots of bias that we need to take into account. Uh, the evolution of the disorder, I showed you that there are very preliminary, preliminary data showing that depending on the stage, there are different type of biomarkers associated. It's very different in acute patients and in patients in between episodes. They don't have the same type of inflammatory markers. For example, a manic episode is associated with a very high inflammatory marker, whereas in between episodes, there are uh, less inflammatory markers. Resistance to treatment seems to be clearly associated with inflammation, with hope to be able to treat resistant schizophrenia and resistant depression with the anti-inflammatory. And of course, uh, there are lots of studies to be performed to demonstrate that there are correlation between peripheral and brain inflammation. So fourth part, and I will conclude after that, uh, what are the consequences in terms of treatment? How can we use what we have demonstrated in terms of everyday treatment? So first, it's been demonstrated in vitro that the treatment we use every day have a very different ability to replicate toxo, which was something, of course, not known and, of course, that we don't use in everyday practice. But you see that uh, the therapeutic index is very different from one, from one treatment to, to another. So it might be something to be replicated, expanded in, in, in vivo and not in vitro, and to see if this... Uh, TOXO can help us to more precisely identify treatment and choose the treatment. The other example of studies come from uh, studies of repositioning. That means that we could study drugs which are already very well known and used uh, largely, which can be studied to see if in add-on study, that means in addition to an ongoing uh, antidepressant or a neuroleptic, adding anti-inflammatory treatment might help uh, the treatment. So this is an example which is uh, NAC, N-acetylcysteine. This is what you take when you cough, which is meat, meat. so it's really treatment which are available over the counter. And the group of Michael Burke in Australia has shown in several studies that high dose of N-acetylcysteine, one gram uh, twice a day during six months, uh, has been shown in add-on treatment to be efficient in uh, a large group of chronic schizophrenia, and there's been meta-analysis for producing this finding. Same in bipolar disorder. So adding to a classical treatment uh, N-acetylcysteine, which has uh, antioxidant action and neurotrophic action, might be uh, very interesting. Same thing with aspirin. So aspirin has been studied by several authors in schizophrenia and in resistant schizophrenia in add-on. And you, show here, you see here in this study that uh, there is a clear reduction of the intensity of symptoms with uh, aspirin add-on to the antipsychotic. Same in resistant depression, and this is really a paper uh, which is considered as very important because it's the first paper to show that, show that stratification on the basis of biomarkers help uh, to identify uh, patients that would respond. This is a study which was published in the JAMA in 2013 in a group of resistant depression where uh, there was a trial on, in add-on of an anti-TNF-alpha antagonist which is uh, Rituximab. And you see on the left that when they, take, they took the, the whole sample which was included, there is no difference whereas the patient received in add-on placebo or infliximab. But when they did a post-doc analysis and they stratified the patients for uh, the presence of an elevated CRP, it's a modest elevation, it was just CRP uh, above three, they show two things. First, it was very efficient in patients with low-grade inflammation defined by something very simple, which is elevated CRP. And the patient with uh, normal uh, CRP did not show any response. So it's really the first study, to my point of view, which shows that precision medicine is available and ready to be, to be studied. Another example which was published in Science uh, in February this year, uh, which shows that uh, it's an animal model where they show that uh, with the maternal immune activation I'm going to describe in a minute, uh, we, they could induce in the fetus uh, occurrence <coughs> of uh, increased uh, IL-6 and increased IL-7 
and explain that by reversing this uh, uh, elevation of antibody of uh, IL-17 cytokines, which induce uh, autistic-like behavior where they could reverse this infection and the production of IL-17, they could reverse the occurrence of autism-like uh, behavior. And this is following studies which were performed by colleagues in California, Ellen Xiao and others who have uh, been able to build a model which is maternal immune activation, which consists during pregnancy to induce inflammation through uh, LPS or through infection. And uh, this leads to the occurrence of autism-related phenotypes in the offsprings, both with behavioral abnormalities, which resemble or mimic uh, symptoms which are found or observed in autism, but also uh, cellular uh, abnormalities in, in the brain of the, the fetus. So it's really a tool that enables us to both induce autism-like uh, abnormalities, but also to, revert, to test different treatments that could reverse them and treatment which are available. Same example performed by the same group in California where uh, they were able to demonstrate in an animal um, maternal immune activation model uh, increased permeability of the digestive tract, change of the microbiota with occurrence of dysbiosis and the capacity to uh, uh, treat this uh, abnormal digestive tract with probiotics. So it's something which is at the very, very beginning, but we have tools to study that now and to study the impact of uh, different treatment. So there are different treatments which can be tested. Uh, first, uh, anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory, for example, uh, anti-cytokines or aspirin, as I just showed you. But also, uh, in resistant depression, you probably know that we test now vagus nerve stimulation, and the hypothesis is that it acts through the diminution of, of cytokine. Probiotic and food complements, and one day maybe uh, cell therapies which could uh, boost and reverse all the immune uh, activation. This has been tested, uh, cell therapies, there are some, some ongoing studies in the States in autism. And just to conclude, uh, this is really what we hope in the field of psychiatry and why we really hope that uh, immunology will help to, to pursue what's being described in this slide. Uh, so today we know that the disorders we are diagnosing uh, are very heterogeneous. This is why there are different colors on the left. Uh, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder are very heterogeneous disorder. And the hope is to be able to uh, improve what we're doing, in particular in our expert centers, where patients are screened and assessed for uh, several clinical dimensions, uh, several environmental factors, uh, but we need to uh, add to this clinical description the biomarkers that have been described, describing inflammation, autoimmunity, oxidative stress, cortisol, neurotransmitters, and of course to perform brain imaging and electrophysiology and probably to add uh, very objective and precise uh, behavioral analysis with the hope that connected tools will bring us uh, the capacity to describe and follow our patients, our patients with objective measures and then to perform machine learning and uh, big data analysis to identify homogeneous subgroups to whom uh, precision medicine could be applied by a strat on stratified patients uh, instead of testing one treatment on the group of schizophrenic patients to identify subgroups, to identify treatments which would be able to target specific pathways and then to be able to uh, decide for a patient in the future uh, targeted treatment based on biological abnormalities to choose specific psychosocial uh, treatment based on their profile and of course to add this to lifetime changes exactly as one what we would do for a patient with diabetes or, or asthma. So just want to conclude because I'm late uh, by thanking, of course, all the people that are working with us. Now we have a network in France working on, on immunology and psychiatry. Uh, first in immunogenetic, in uh, Laboratoire Jean Dosset in Saint Louis. Second uh, in Bordeaux at the CNRS with Laurent Roch, who is doing all the molecular neuroimaging that I described. In Jérôme Monora Lab, who is able to identify brain uh, autoantibodies, and I just give you one, but there are many more to be tested. 
uh, with Nicola Glashenhaus in uh, Sofia Antipolis, who, who does all the cytokine that are measurements that I have been describing, and with Jean Neuro with Hervé Perron, who's working on the endogenous retrovirus. Of course, my department is very implicated in the identification of this immunological background, same as my lab, and we work uh, also uh, in international background with the Stanley Foundation, and uh, we have several collaborations in India and now in Tunisia to try to identify better the, this immune dysfunction. Thank you very much. <laughs>